As a game developer, I have tried too many times to make good feeling first person movement. And after spending several months last year making a movement system that just ended up being mid, I've decided fuck it. These mechanics have already been perfected across many games made by actual, real professionals. So this time round, I'm... First, it's important to introduce the backbone of all well-designed movement systems, which is the state machine. In this system, we define different movement states that the player can be in, like walking, falling, wall running, and sliding. From here, we can define conditions that transition the player from one of these states to the other. For example, the player can transition from the ground state to the air state by falling off the ground or by jumping. The advantage of this approach is that it allows us to write code that is only executed when the player is in a particular state, allowing us to specify exactly how we want the movement to handle whilst the player is on the ground versus when the player is in the air. Now that we've got that out of the way, we can start off with the simplest mechanic that all good movement systems have in common, momentum. The player should be able to build up speed going in a particular direction and have the choice between maintaining their speed by having to slowly change their direction or changing the direction rapidly by sacrificing their speed. A lot of bad controllers will either allow the player to change their momentum with no penalty whatsoever or stop any horizontal velocity when the player lets go of the movement keys, both of which we don't want. Implementing momentum requires using linear interpolation. For those of you here that actually touch grass, linear interpolation, or lerping, is where you find the value at a certain point between two input values. The position of this point is specified by the weight, where 0 returns the first input and 1 returns the second input. Applying this to our movement controller, we specify a speed, acceleration and drag for each movement state. Speed is the length of the wish velocity vector, which specifies the direction the player wants to move. Acceleration specifies how fast the player's current velocity interpolates towards their wish velocity when they are pressing any movement keys. And drag specifies how fast the player's current velocity interpolates towards zero when no movement keys are pressed. These values allow us to customize how the movement handles in each state. For example, in the ground state, the player has a fair fairly high acceleration and drag, giving the player both more control over their movement direction and applying more friction whilst they're on the ground. However, when the player is in the air state, they have lower acceleration and drag, preserving the momentum from when they were on the ground and giving them less directional control whilst they're in the air. As long as we make sure to only change the velocity through linear interpolation, the momentum built up by the player shouldn't change abruptly. Let's move on to the most iconic mechanic that we're stealing from Source games, air strafing. This is a staple of not only most Source Engine games, but also many games that are descendants of the original Quake engine. To cut a long story short, due to Quake's original source code, holding left or right whilst in the air allowed the player to gain speed. The speed gained was determined by the angle the player's input direction made against their current velocity, with the player gaining speed with angles approaching 90 degrees. Directions after 90 degrees caused a sharp decrease in the player's velocity, and value input below this threshold caused no change in speed. Sweek and Matt's ramblings both have more in-depth explanations of how exactly air strafing works, but for the sake of this video, this explanation is all you need. In Godot, we're going to recreate something similar to air strafing using curves. When the player is in the air state, the game will calculate the angle between their wish velocity and the current velocity, and use this angle to sample a curve. The value sampled from this curve will be used as a multiplier with the player's current wish velocity. The player's speed will then be linearly interpolated towards this greater speed. Implementing this mechanic through curves allows this feature to be easily customized. Strafe curves that are very tight, meaning the angle required to gain speed is very small, encourage the player to rapidly move their mouse while holding W to gain speed. As the strafe curves get wider, the player needs to use A and D and mouse movement to make greater angles with their velocity in order to gain speed. Whilst this implementation certainly isn't faithful to the original Quake engine, it introduces an interesting piece of movement tech that makes the movement system far more engaging. We're yoinking, oh, that's a funny ass word. We're yoinking the next two mechanics from one of my favorite games of all time, Titanfall 2. The first of these is wall running. When the player jumps onto a wall, they begin a wall run that lasts 1.75 seconds. At the end, they fall off the wall. If the player wants to wall run continuously, then they need to jump onto a wall on the opposite side. The player can also continue wall running on the same wall if they make contact below the point where they jumped off. Lastly, when the player jumps off the wall during a wall run, an impulse is applied in the direction of the wall's normal. 
Taking all these together, we can easily recreate this mechanic by adding a new movement state. When the player collides with a wall whilst in the air state, they enter the wall running state. Whilst in this state, we determine which way the player was moving along the wall and push them in that direction. We also apply a slight force in the opposite direction of the wall's normal to ensure the player keeps contact with the wall throughout the entire wall run. Similarly to Titanfall, re-grabbing is allowed if contact is made below where the player jumped off, switching sides allows the player to reset the wall run timer, and jumping off the wall applies an impulse in the direction of the wall's normal. However, it can be slightly difficult to tell when the wall run is going to end, so we're going to use a curve to choreograph the progress of the wall run. Near the beginning, the player will gain some height and continue to lose height until eventually they're kicked off. This should both make the wall run feel more dynamic and help the player better judge when they need to jump off the wall. The second mechanic we're taking from Titanfall is sliding. If the player is moving faster than the start slide threshold and presses the crouch button, they will enter the slide state. Entering the state will apply an impulse in the direction of their velocity called a slide boost. This has a cooldown of two seconds to ensure that the player can't just spam this to build infinite speed. Whilst in the sliding state, the player can change the direction of their speed, but the magnitude of their speed will always linearly interpolate towards zero. Once their speed goes below the end slide threshold, they will then return back to the ground state. The drag applied to the player's speed progresses along this curve for 0.6 seconds, with very low drag at the start to make it feel more slippery, and more drag at the end to simulate friction slowing down the slide. However, we only progress along this curve normally if the player is sliding along flat ground. In Godot, 3D character controllers have a property called Floor Max Angle. This determines how steep a slope can be before we treat it like a wall, meaning we can't walk on it. We can use this value and compare it to the angle of the slope we're currently standing on to get the slope's incline in a 0 to 1 range, where 0 is flat ground and 1 is the steepest slope we can walk on. Using this value, we can sample from the slope angle curve and multiply this with our value from the slide drag curve. This allows us to change how much drag we use depending on the incline of the slope, with slight inclines behaving similarly to flat ground and steep slopes almost entirely ignoring drag. And lastly, no movement controller would be complete without a grappling hook. The way most grappling hooks are implemented is by creating a spring between the player and their target and applying a force to the player using the spring. The force applied is calculated with Hooke's Law, which describes how springs work in real life. Basically, we calculate how far the spring is from its rest length, which is the length of the spring where no force is exerted on it. We then multiply this distance by its stiffness, yes, this is a real term used by actual physicists, to calculate the force the spring will apply at its end. The only in-game difference is that we also retract the spring over time. When the player launches the grappling hook, the rest length is set to 0.9 times the distance between the player and the target. The spring's rest length is then reduced to 0.2 times this distance over 0.8 seconds following this curve. The last additions to this controller were some game juice, which could be seen throughout this video. These are, in short, the jumping camera animation, the landing camera animation, increasing the FOV proportion to the speed, increasing the camera shake proportion to the speed, tilting during a slide, tilting during wall running, and head bopping. I then quickly threw together a level using all of these mechanics alongside a jump pad that, well it's a jump pad, I don't know what else you expect it to do, and a slowing pad that slows the player's velocity by a certain percentage when the player hits it. If you enjoyed this, feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in about 6 months, bozos.